Mr. Jones, we've got the uh, February 15th meeting of the City High Points Public Safety Committee. We have one item on the agenda. Uh, here present with me, I've got uh, Councilman Britt Moore, Councilman Chris Williams, and Councilman Tyler Johnson. Uh, all members of the committee are here present. Our first and only item on the agenda today is item 2023-076, an update on the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network with uh, Police Chief Travis Trapp. All right, thank you guys for having us again. Um, before we get started, we had a couple of people that are with me today, and ma the majority of this presentation will be done by a couple of our, our workhorses that are out there in the street and getting things done. But I'll make sure you know who, who all is in the room with us. We have Detective Dan Sellers, who works in our Violent Crimes Unit. Detective Jordan Lemons, he works in our Strategic Intelligence Unit, but he is also cross-sworn with the ATF. So he's our ATF Task Force Officer. We have Assistant Chief Kevin Ray, who's over our investigation section and Captain Pete Abernathy, who's the captain over our investigation section. So you probably know Pete from his many days in traffic, but we moved him around. We shuffled on Pete and threw him a, threw a fast one, moved him around the PD a little bit. They'll be doing the bulk of the presentation, but I do want to set it up a little bit before they actually get into the PowerPoint, uh, which should be in front of you. As you all know, addressing violent crime, specifically Violent gun crime is our number one priority inside the city. You've heard me say it a thousand times. You've heard me say it a thousand times more that that is the number one thing that will crush your city first. Um, it, it will really put you in the damper quickly. So we try to stay on top of those things. And we have a good, pretty long standing history of doing that inside this city, despite what you may see on the news, not just here, but all over the place. We have we have put up a good fight and, and you know, I think our numbers show it. A uh, big portion of this presentation is going to tie back into the NIBIN program, which all of you are very familiar with because Chief Schultz presented on it to you guys. I've done it many times. We've asked you to help us in many facets, get some things in place to help us push this program. So I think you're pretty familiar with that. You don't need a lot of reflection on what the NIBIN program does, but that, uh, that integrated ballistics information network is very, very important to us. And we work stair step to get to this point where it can bring us some results. And I think this case that they're going to present on today does that quite a bit. You know, one thing before I get really into the nuts and bolts of this thing, I want to tell you this, and I think you guys understand that because you've been very supportive of us. We are going to promote proactive policing inside of this city. We are going to come after bad guys. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, I want our officers to be very aggressive out there when we're going after bad guys. And when I say aggressive, I don't mean in like an abusive way or a malicious way or anything like that. There's a definite way to p police. Uh, we understand what those parameters are. and We've got a great history of staying within those parameters, as you can very well tell. Uh, but I want our folks to be aggressive out there. And there's a reason behind that, though. You know, the analogy I like to give to our folks is if you're not going to go out and do proactive policing, meaning going after bad guys, the ones that you know are committing crime, it's almost like playing a basketball game where you say, you know what, we're just going to play defense. We're not going to cross half court. We're not going to go to the other end of the court. We're not going to shoot the ball or anything like that at all. We'll just play defense and let's see if we win. I mean, I know I'm just a dumb cop, but I can tell you who's going to win that game. We're not going to win. So I want our people to be on the offensive. We're going to figure out who our bad guys are. We've done it through folks deterrence through years and years and years. These violent offenders, particularly the gun offenders through our VCTF. Uh, we did it with our gang initiative many years ago. And this is just another piece of that puzzle where we're helping to build upon that. Um, 2020, you haven't seen our 2020 numbers yet. 2022 numbers yet. We uh, The end of the year per report is being produced now. I just reviewed it yesterday. It'll be produced publicly later on. You'll see those numbers. We end up at 2022 at minus 4% in impact crimes. That's pretty awesome because what that minus 4% means is that we were minus 4% in impact crimes better than 2021. And we were also down that year as well. You've heard me say it down in our business is good. That's what we want. So that tells me our folks are out there getting after crime and trying to arrest bad guys. Um, we seized 450 guns last year, 450. That has been a mission for us as a police department to target those illegal firearms. And I always want to make sure I clarify when we're talking about going after guns, we're talking about guns that are used in the commission of a crime or guns that people are prohibited from carrying in the first place because they've been convicted of a crime already. Those are the two level of guns we want. The rest of them we're not worried about. So 450 last year, that's a record for us. I imagine we're probably going to try and top that again this year because it's going to be our focus as well. So before we get into this, let them turn over the presentation, what we're going to do is work through a case 
uh, that these guys and many others investigated that started on Halloween night here in the city of High Point and then has spawned into something very, very grand. What you'll see in the PowerPoint, the graphics are, are very, well, graphic. Uh, they, they sort of bring home the big picture of it. But I'll let them go through the case sort of step by step with you to an extent. We have asked them to pull back a little bit and not put everything in the PowerPoint. A lot of what you see in here will be redacted. Uh, we do have a case that we got to prosecute in court. None of this is done yet. We've made the charges. We still got to go to court and get convictions on these things. So it's very, very important. So they'll sort of take you through the steps and how important it was uh, from getting these investigative leads, the NIBIN coming into play, the interagency cooperation. This wasn't just a couple of people who did this. It's a lot of people who put a lot of time on the ground to make this thing happen. Um, so those are a couple of important things I want you to know. But before we get started, as they're giving this presentation, because it should be pretty impressive. They did it for our command staff, and it was very impressive. Uh, a couple of things I want you to remember as they're talking. This is the importance of hiring the right people out the gate. Don't change your standards. Stay with your standards. Get the people in the door who want to do this job and are willing and capable to do the job that you're getting ready to see put on the board. This job's not made for everybody. I know we're short 41 officers. We're not taking just everybody. We only want the best. I want people who are going to come in here and get the job done like this. So hire the right people. As a city, as a police department, and as a city government, we cannot go soft on crime. There's been a lot of push on that. Can you believe it across the country to go soft on things? You cannot do it. Because I'm going to tell you, you go soft, there should be an equal side out there that says victims on the other side of it. And guess who those victims are? Your constituents. Our citizens, they, every single time there's going to be a victim. And they seem to sort of get discarded and lost in the mix. Um, and, well, I don't like those things. You know, that, that sort of twists us up a little bit. Because uh, that's what we're here for, to advocate for those folks. Uh, but I will tell you, what you're getting ready to see in just a minute, the work that these men and women put in, this is how you get to negative 4%. That is not an accident over the course of the last year. Uh, a lot of time and effort was put in just on this case alone. And you'll see the timeline that they're in. I imagine there wasn't a whole lot of family time for these folks. I don't know how they did see their families, but they made a lot of great cases, a lot of impact packed in there. You're going to see one case is going to spawn into many here in just a second. So one thing I will ask you, when they're going through the presentation, if you have specific questions, try to make them more generalized into, as far as violent crime goes or the NIBIN program or something like that. I don't want to get into a lot of specific questions to the detectives about this case. They're going to give you what they can, but beyond that, I'm going to ask them not to answer a lot of specific questions on that case. Again, charging is one thing, conviction is another. We got to, still got a road to go down, okay? Any questions to me before I turn it over to Dan? Are you going first? Detective Sellers first. Any questions? All right, thank you guys. Good afternoon. Hey, I'm Detective Sellers of the Violent Crime Unit. All right. So this began uh, for us on Halloween night, October 31st. We had um, a shooting in the 1400 block of Bridges Drive in which two children who were preparing to go out trick-or-treating were shot and gravely injured, a 10 and 14 year old. Through the investigation, uh, we determined that two vehicles were used in this shooting and both were stolen out of Greensboro uh, prior. And uh, that the intended target for this shooting was a known, a known blood gang member. Um, two days later, uh, officers located a, one of the stolen vehicles on Shadow Valley Road and uh, that led to a search warrant at that location. A stolen firearm, which was actually used in the, the shooting, was located at that location along with DeMont Williams, who was taken into custody. Um, after his arrest, he admitted to his involvement and provided a good bit of information. He was subsequently charged with assault with deadly weapon, intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, conspiracy to commit first degree murder, Discharging a weapon into a vehicle causing serious injury, discharging a weapon from a moving vehicle for gang purposes and possession of stolen goods. You'll see a lot of these come up again. Unfortunately, we had a second uh, event in the series of events that occurred on November 8th uh, at 12.06 a.m. in the Brentwood Crossing Apartments, which is also a known blood gang territory. Uh, 
multiple 911 calls were received from multiple residents uh, describing shots being fired from the roadway um, and a victim having been shot in the leg and severely injured. He was transported and treated for his injuries. Uh, as well as uh, him being hit, uh, one of the city electrical uh, transformers attached to a pole was struck in which cut out power for the entire apartment complex for a good amount of time before it was replaced. That first, the first case is the one that was a gas station on Bridges Drive. It's just Street. down the street. It was, yeah, it, it, it was outside of a residence. Okay. Yeah. But you're close, yeah. right down the street from the gas station. Yes, sir. As part of this investigation, we recovered 19 spent shell casings from the crime scene. Video surveillance showed that the suspects were using a Kia Optima uh, and shooting, and we had a driver and two shooters uh, coming out of the window shooting from the vehicle. Uh, that, this case was assigned to me, and through the investigation, we determined this was also a stolen vehicle from Greensboro just several hours prior. Um, the vehicle was later recovered uh, on Copperstone Drive, uh, and it had five spent shell casings, which matched the shell casings we found in the street uh, as part of the crime scene. November 10th, we had our third shooting incident that's related back at the same location, the Brentwood Crossing Apartments. Uh, again, multiple shots were fired. Uh, fortunately, no one was struck or injured, but multiple vehicles were struck and a building as well. Uh, we found 32 spent shell casings from that crime scene. And of course, there was a fourth shooting on November 13th at 825 PM in the 1700 block of Lamb Avenue, which is just around the corner from the apartment complex, the same apartment complex. Uh, a male was riding his bicycle on a lamb when a vehicle approached him and shots were fired from both a driver and a front passenger. Uh, he was struck in the arm and was treated for his injuries. Um, only one shell casing was found in this shooting. On November 14th, we arrested Justin Williams, Jeterius Price, and Khalid Thomas, uh, who had outstanding secure custody orders, which is basically the juvenile equivalent of a warrant for arrest. Uh, upon uh, our interview with Williams, uh, he admitted to being affiliated with the Crips, not necessarily a full, full Crip member, but affiliation. And he admitted to being involved with the shooting on uh, November 8th, and uh, the shooting on October 31st. And uh, the shooting from the 8th, he claimed to be the driver of the stolen Kia Optima, while the other two, Price and Thomas, were the, the trigger pullers. Um, Williams also admit that Price and Thomas were involved in the third shooting. Um, and in that case, he also admitted to having pulled the trigger himself from the roadway while operating the uh, Kia Sorento, which was also stolen. Uh, that vehicle was later recovered uh, on Samet Drive very, in very close proximity to Williams's residence. Um, 13 spent casings were located inside the Kia Sorento that matched the casings found on Brentwood Street from one of the shootings. On the 13th, a Toyota Camry was, again, stolen from Greensboro, and that was what was used uh, on Lamb Avenue for that shooting. Uh, that vehicle was also later recovered on the 14th during our operation to arrest the three juveniles. It was located nearby uh, one of the residences. Investigators with GPD shared surveillance footage, which clearly showed Khalid Thomas stealing one of the the Toyota Camry, which was within hours used in the shooting on Lamb Avenue. Uh, he was even wearing the same clothes when we arrested him. And this was just hours later. Um, a Nibin lead was generated by the ATF, which matched the recovered shell casing from uh, Lamb Avenue to one of the pistols we recovered on November 14th. Due to this lead, the pistol's recovery and related charges by street crimes detectives, an additional juvenile who I won't name today, 
uh, was also identified and charged. As I said uh, previously, you'll, the, a lot of the charges we've already looked at, assault with a deadly weapon, intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, uh, discharging a weapon from a moving vehicle, injuring wires and other fixtures, discharging a firearm in occupied property, injury to real property, personal property, and possession of stolen goods were the uh, summary of charges that these uh, four individuals saw. Again, we have a, a fifth suspect who is still uh, being handled by the juvenile court, so we're not going to go much further into that. Uh, just to, just to kind of help uh, summarize things and put things in chronological order, uh, I've created a timeline of events here. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of briefly go through it just to kind of show you how we were able to think about this case as a collection of many cases involved in a spree. Uh, our first started on uh, October 29th with the theft of a vehicle, uh, an Acura in Greensboro. On the 30th, we had theft of a Honda Accord in Greensboro. 31st, we had another theft of a Nissan Altima along with the pistol that was inside the vehicle. And of course, we had the shooting of the two children on Halloween night um, using two of those three vehicles. On November 2nd, we had the recovery of the Acura uh, along with two pistols. Uh, November 4th, we had the recovery of the Honda Accord and the Nissan Altima. So it looks like the majority of these vehicles are being stolen out of Greensboro. Then they end up All of the ones involved in this case were stolen out of Greensboro. These vehicles are uh, unlocked vehicles that were left running as people went inside the store to go buy something and uh, came back to find their car missing. And in many of these cases, it's just within a few hours later, the shooting occurs. So it's, it's as if the vehicles are being stolen with the purpose to then go commit a shooting. So they knew they were going to go do this, so they go locate the That's my belief, vehicle, yes. Then come back and do it. Yeah. Okay, we'll continue on with the theft of a Kia Optima. Uh, same, very similar circumstances from Greensboro on November 7th. <laughs> November 8th was the second shooting uh, we had. Um, in that case, we had 19 shell casings recovered uh, and someone struck by gunfire. Uh, the next day, we recovered um, that vehicle along with five additional shell casings. We had another vehicle theft of a Kia Sorento in Greensboro on the 10th. Uh, we had our third shooting uh, at Brentwood Crossing Apartments. This one would be the second at Brentwood Crossing Apartments. This one involved um, 32 spent shell casings recovered at the scene and a Kia Sorento, uh, which was later recovered the next day. Uh, street crimes detectives and myself found that one uh, within walking distance of one of the suspect's apartments. Uh, I searched it myself and found 13 shell casings. Uh, the, the following Sunday, the 13th, we had another motor vehicle theft of the Toyota Camry, which was soon after followed by the uh, fourth and final shooting on Lamb Avenue. Uh, the following day, that Monday the 14th, was when we uh, initiated our operation to uh, uh, execute secure custody orders. And in doing so, we recovered the stolen Toyota Camry, uh, arrested Justin Williams, uh, Khalid Thomas, and Jeterius Price while recovering four uh, pistols that we know from Nibin were used in the commission of these shootings. Uh, and just to kind of update the timeline on the uh, January 31st, we had a grand jury hearing and all the uh, juvenile um, suspects were bounded over into adult superior courts. They will be tried in superior court, not juvenile court in Guilford County. Um, and after I thought we were done making charges, thanks to Nibin, we were able to connect an additional shell casing from the shooting on Lamb Avenue, the one shell casing we found came back to one of the four guns that we collected um, on the 14th, uh, which 
was a key piece of evidence in leading to charges uh, against the juvenile that we've that I've talked about. So with that, that wraps up our time. I'm going to turn it over to Detective Lemons here to discuss our uh, Nibin map here. Just one quick, is some of the, one of the suspects you said that you arrested lived over there near Samet Drive. I see Admiral Drive, see Samet Drive where the vehicles are recovered. So yes, sir. This is a, the resident was over there committing crimes not only in Greensboro but also in other areas of Five Point. So it's, yeah. Exactly. So like you said, I was Jordan Lemons. Uh, I'm the ATF TFO for High Point. Um, I kind of assisted on the back end being part of the strategic intelligence unit, helping with the Nibin side of things. So um, as you can see in this chart, um, it's quite confusing at the first look of it. <laughs> and this is only probably like a third of it. Um, it had to be shrinked down quite a bit. Um, if not, it would just look like a bunch of dots and lines everywhere. So trying to condense it a little bit to help explain it. Um, so basically, to summarize, so he was going through these cases and you could, he was listing out all these evidence casings. So these casings being collected in stolen vehicles that are unoccupied, they could be just abandoned after they were used. Um, searching these cars, we find these shell casings inside the cars. Um, every single one of them gets triaged and entered in the Niven. Um, when this was going on, we were rushing these. So we were going through our crime lab and getting them processed, um, doing everything we can to get them entered as fast as we can. Um, we've kind of changed the process with the Niven a little bit. We're, we're, using, we're using Greensboro has a Niven machine currently. Um, and we can rush these over there, get them entered, and I can get responses back in like an hour. It's pretty amazing. Um, this case right here is one of the first that we've been able to uh, use this approach where we sped things up and it just started exploding with leads. Um, so it started off where if you're looking at this chart, you have pictures of guns and you have pictures of casings. Um, the pictures of the guns means these guns are seized and they are in the custody of law enforcement somewhere. Um, it could be any agency, it could be us, anyone. Uh, the casing means that's a gun, but it's still on the street and it's still out there committing crimes being used to commit crimes, basically. So we first started developing these charts and we, were, we would lay it out there and we could see, all right, there's a gun here that's being used in these crimes. Um, we would feed this information uh, as the intelligence to our street crimes guys and patrol and they'd go out there and try to locate them. And that's when they started getting these guns doing, as he was shown on the timeline, these different instances where they would find the vehicles, they were doing search warrants at locations, making arrests and recovering guns. Um, we were able to actually, it was cool to see because you could see the chart and it would be, we'd plug a gun into a spot we didn't have it the day before. So we'd plug that in and boom, it would open up more stuff. The next one, get another gun, put that in, it would just blow up. Um, so we kept getting more and more information. Um, so basically with these connections, um, the guns that are seized, they're test fired and entered. Um, and then the evidence cases are triaged and they can determine how many different guns are used and they enter them all and then we start doing the connections. Um, and that's what gives us this right here. So each one of those blocks are incidences of uh, a gun was involved in it somehow. It could be a casing was recovered at a scene. Um, it could be anything from uh, we seized a gun from a traffic stop off somebody. Um, arrest was made, anything like that. It has to be gun related that's on here. So as you can see, it's quite a bit on there. Um, I kind of broke it down in numbers a little bit um, on the larger scale of this. This is the smaller scale version because it was just too cluttered to really show. Um, altogether, it was 18 different firearms that were used um, involving these guys. That's a lot of guns. Um, 14 of them were 9 millimeter handguns. One was a 45 caliber handgun. Two were a 40 caliber handgun. One was a 22 caliber handgun. Um, just involving High Point alone that was related with firearms, um, there were 17 incidences. Um, incidences outside of High Point, this includes Greensboro, Guilford County, Graham, Burlington, and Winston-Salem. Um, there was 18 incidences. Um, so as you can see, I mean, that, that's a lot. Um, proactive cases for High Point PD, um, there were seven incidences within this chart of just our guys going out and recovering these guns, these cars and making arrests and 
basically us getting that information from them, getting the casings and test fires and the guns and plugging them in there, which was giving us more and more and showing what kind of damage these guys were doing out here on the street. Um, you could see like, if you look at the chart in the center there at one gun, all those lines coming off of it is that gun being fired at a scene. Not just once, but a lot of them, there's tons of gun, the cases being, I mean, some of them were at 20s and 30s times that's fired. So it just kind of shows that. And then they start crossing over lines with other guns. So that tells you that gun was there too. Um, so Niven was, it's a very good tool for investigation for intelligence purposes where we can start linking these together and you start dissecting all these reports and which gives you even more leads to follow, more vehicles to look for. Well, what, you could find a car on the side of the road just abandoned. We would find that car. You wouldn't think nothing of it, but there's a shell casing in it. Let's go in there and see what happened. Well, surprising that it was used in a shooting and, that, and we wouldn't know that without this. Um, that's what's the cool part about it. So um, Nibin has, it was a helpful tool, helpful tool. It doesn't put the gun in your hand when it comes to the ACE. It gives you a lead to follow for guys like sellers and our violent crimes to pursue and start doing interviews and kind of doing the digging. It helps point in direction. So um, that's pretty much on the Nibin side of it. If y'all have any other questions or. Now the Nibin's just reading the imprint left by the firing pin, correct? Yes. It deals with the striker pin and the like the ejector, um, the way the markings that leave on it. It's identical to, it's basically like a fingerprint for a gun. You know, so every, every single gun is different. And it'll leave that same imprint regardless of the manufacturer, the ammunition. Primer. Yeah, and there's experts that actually visually inspect them. And then they go through a computer system that has to be reviewed by other people that are trained in this. And they can, they can determine it identically, say this right here, without a doubt came from this gun and they can testify to court in it. So, I mean, it's very, it's a very good tool. I don't think there's anything else. Let's see. Thank you, Jordan. Did you want anything else, Dave? Yeah, this is your progress today. Yeah, just, just, hey, just to piggyback off what he was saying, uh, as an investigator, someone who's tasked to, to look into these cases, uh, it's, very helpful for us to have a mechanism in which NIBIN leads are generated quickly in a timely manner. Uh, I spent the better half of my morning this morning reviewing brand new leads that were from six months ago, which is a helpful part of an investigation, but a lead six months later really is not that much help. So uh, having uh, that kind of analysis that quickly has been a, a great benefit to our to this investigation particularly uh, just to kind of wrap it up um, we had over 40 juvenile petitions and criminal charges in this case uh, all charges were approved by the Department of Juvenile Justice which we already said were also approved by a grand jury in Greensboro uh, Search warrants conducted on seized cell phones and social media accounts from this case have also led to more charges and uh, new investigative leads to unsolved homicides. So the success of this case has also had a ripple effect in other cases, thankfully. Um, calls for gun and gang related offenses at Brentwood Crossing, which has been a very uh, huge hotspot for us for call volume and violent crime has reduced 50% since making these arrests. Um, and not even in High Point, additional charges, we were just talking about that before the meeting that uh, Winston-Salem reaches out to us, Guilford County, we have other leads in other jurisdictions that are coming to light because of what Niven's been able to tell us from this investigation. Um, and I already mentioned we have the secured custody order, uh, which is the most recent development in, in this case. So uh, it would not surprise me if another few weeks pass and there are more developments, uh, but that's, that's where we are as of now. So that pretty much wraps it up for me. Chief, you want to take it over? Thank you. Appreciate it. Good job. So as you can see, you know, we've, like I just mentioned, between Schultz and myself, we've been pushing this on you for years. But I also think during a lot of these presentations that we've done, we predicted 
This is exactly the result you were going to get down the road. It was going to start opening all kinds of doors for us, unfortunate doors. We don't want this stuff to happen at all. But when it does, it's our job to investigate it, make arrests, and hopefully these folks end up going to jail. But we predicted this was how it was going to work at the end of the day. So while Nibin, I love Nibin. I think it's a wonderful tool. It's technology at its finest, and it's probably going to keep advancing. Uh, I think it's a major piece of the puzzle that is probably going to be bigger. We're still pushing our NIBIN program. I wouldn't say we're anywhere close to 100% where we need to be. Uh, but it's a stair-step process. It's a very expensive business to get into. Uh, it's from the personnel side. It's unfortunate we work in a very cutthroat business. Uh, you got to train people, you got to hire the right people, and you got to train them, which is very timely and expensive. And other agencies have no problem poaching them from you uh, for a couple of dollars more. So we have to be very careful when we go along those lines. We want them to come and work here and do our work here. So we have a long way to go in this program. We are continuing to take steps that go with it. Um, so, but at the end of the day, NIBIN is a tool. That's what it is. Unless you have a body or bodies that are willing to put the time and the effort in to go with this, you really just got one piece of a multi-piece puzzle, and that's never going to work. So it really is kudos to our folks for putting this case together. Uh, and the case is just a little bit of what we're talking about here. It's the overall picture of when you do put the right people on the ground, you work cooperatively with each other. I mean, they're in constant contact with Greensboro, Guilford, Winston, whomever else. I mean, we, we mentioned Graham, Burlington. That is what we're going to have to do now as agencies. It can only be siloed. I mean, it's a regional thing. It's probably much bigger than regional, actually, I would guess. Um, we probably don't even know everything. We got a 15-day span where this is what we know, knew what happened. There's no way we took days off in between. I don't buy that. There's things we haven't uncovered yet. So overall, it's a wonderful case. I don't want this case you know, to be just the sole focus of it. It's the overall picture of what these folks were able to accomplish. And again, I'll reiterate one more time. This is how you get to minus 4%. It is going to take this kind of effort on a consistent basis, doing it the right way to get this done. But I appreciate the support that you've given us. That has been a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, every time I've come here and asked for something, if we've been able to articulate it, you give me a thumbs up on it, or Schultz, because uh, he was a big catalyst in this and getting it running for us and off the ground in the day. So I appreciate your efforts and support to us, and I think it just shows as a city, when we're sort of working on the same page, this is what can be done. Now. I wish none of these things had ever happened, but they did. So, any questions? Several. Um, Council Williams, I were just kind of conversing, but how does NIBIN work with relation to, and I kind of know the answer, but I wanted to make sure I clarify, it. when it comes to like the homemade guns, ghost guns, that type of stuff, um, tracking those and being able to connect those with different crimes. Jordan, you're probably going to have to at least jump in on this one. So on the, with ghost guns, so obviously they have no serial number. Um, but they still are the same. They're still got firing pins. It's, everything can be identified. We can still link the casing to that gun. Um, the only thing is, is there's no serial number. So if we come across that gun out on the street, we seize it, we test fire it, that'll, Nibin will tell us that gun is the gun that committed these crimes. So that's one thing. It can still be traced even without the serial number. So they change out the firing pin, they would also throw it off correct. Yeah, there's creative ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, other question would be, so we're seeing a majority of these vehicles are coming from surrounding municipalities. Mm -hmm. um, are the guns similarly coming from other municipalities where they were originally stolen and then used for crimes here? Yeah, a lot of them are being stolen from vehicles. That's the most common thing. Um, you've got these unlocked cars going around through neighborhoods, breaking in at night on unlocked cars to them leaving the engine running at a gas station and leaving the, having their gun in the car with it. Um, these are the guns we're seeing a lot of times being used. Um, not saying all of them. Some of them could be trading back and forth between gangs and they move around and change hands. So. I guess what I'm getting at is are a lot of the guns coming from outside of High Point, being stolen from outside of High Point and then being used here? I would say it's pretty even. I mean, it's across the board. We have a lot of guns getting stolen from High Point just as much as Greensboro. So, yeah, yeah we get a lot of them. We got cars getting stolen here that are getting used for crimes in Greensboro, too. It's kind of it just crazy. overlaps. Yeah, I know the one that happened in my area back off of Johnson Street a while back was vehicles that were stolen out of Durham. Mm -hmm. They ended up coming here or whatever and, and committing it, but they shot at the officer or whatever. Yep. Yeah. I just. I see some of the stuff on the media and whatnot, and I know when you, you spray your own yard, you don't kill the mosquitoes, it just goes to your neighbor's yard, you know, yeah. and 
with our proactive policing and effective law enforcement and some of the other places that don't do proactive policing and they're seeing spikes, I think we're definitely a safer city than a lot of areas in North Carolina. I just know that sometimes the effect of some of that crime from those areas ends up coming here. And that, that, that's part of being a TFO with our office. We have agencies all over the area, are all in the same, we work out of the same office. I mean, I'm, I'm here too. So kind of seeing what they're experiencing and the staffing shortages and just trying to react as best as they can. I mean, they're, they're getting tore up. <laughs> just to be straight up yeah. honest with you. Uh, they're, they're just getting hammered right now, so. Hey, two points on when, thank you, Jordan. Um, when, when, Jordan was saying we got people are going through neighborhoods and breaking into cars. What it means is they're just going into unlocked cars. We see very few forced entries into vehicles. It's all unlocked vehicles. We got tons of ring cameras and everything else that we watch these people do. And it's a pretty simple process. We got plenty of video of people coming up and yanking on a car door that's locked. And guess what happens? They move along. It's a pretty simple defeat right there. But the ones that are open, and I can't, I can't imagine leaving my firearm in a car. Uh, but Clearly, it happens quite a bit, but Kevin is correct. I don't want to like push it off on everybody else and act like we don't have problems here. We do. We got plenty of cars stolen and plenty of guns stolen, just like everybody else. Um, but to your point, Councilman Jones, on the proactive policing, you know, I've never made that a secret since I took over in 2020. I want us to be proactive. I want us to push the envelope. Um, you know, with the number of guns that are left in cars and are getting stolen, we are seizing. 30 some odd percent of our guns that we those 450 are taken off of vehicle stops that's a lot of guns They're, we're only we're only touching the ice tip of the iceberg here folks but uh, that's why we're going to continue to stop cars inside the city it might be for minor motor vehicle violations you still have to have reasonable position or probable cause to make the stop but we need officers who are going to take that investigation further if that's where the evidence leads them so we're going to continue to do those things that's why i do i do agree with you mr councilman jones that's why we don't see the spikes if we quit doing those things, again, if you quit doing those things, you just relegate yourself to playing defense. We're just gonna play defense now. You cannot do that and expect to win this infinite game that we're in. We're in the infinite game. There is no fourth quarter, there is no buzzer. It's gonna continue to go every single day, but that doesn't mean you quit playing the game. We're going to keep fighting to keep our citizens safe. But I do want bad guys to know, or criminals, when they cross over the city limits in the high point, I want them thinking, man, those boys and girls might stop me in high point because we will. They, they don't commit crime. It's a pretty simple process. You don't commit crime. You don't do these things. You're probably not going to get stopped. But if you do, I expect our people to be proactive and enforce the, the law like we're sworn to do. We put our hand on the Bible to do it, and you better do it in this city. But again, it all traces back to hiring the right people in the first place. It's as simple as that. Any other questions? I, um, Mr. Chairman, if you will, I have like a couple of questions and maybe a few requests for of staff. Um, the first one, um, well, I guess it's kind of a, a request. When you get your 2022 numbers for us, um, can we be sure that we kind of keep it like a overall picture, you know, that, that talks about like what the numbers look like per capita, what, um, you know, like our numbers versus our neighbors, that kind of deal. I think that's important that we realize what that is um, in those numbers. Um, I guess that's not really a question. Um, the other one is a question. <clears throat> so I, I'm trying to respect the um, idea of, you know, that you don't want us to ask specific things. And, and correct me if I'm wrong from what I could see here. The ages were between 17 and 19 of the suspects. Does that include the juvenile that you can't really speak to right now? I don't that, know how he's younger. Age? Yeah, he's much younger. And of course, the ones that were even juveniles that we charged have been bound over as adults. That's why we're able to put their information up there. But the, right. the one that's not been named, I don't remember what his age was. It was much younger. Okay. Well, unfortunately, just, just helps me picture, you know. Uh, but it's a good point that you're bringing up because that is what we're seeing as our biggest group that we're having to you know, this driving crime. It's the younger group in there. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been hard for us as an agency, as law enforcement overall, because the raise the age thing happened, um, in, I guess, 2019. Is that I got my dates correct? December 2019, where everybody under 18 became a juvenile. And that system is much harder for us to navigate and, and prosecute these hardcore crimes. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't want our juveniles to go to prison. I want them to get out of the business altogether. But there's some 
You're in the business. You're in the business of committing adult crimes. You need to be treated like an adult. So that has definitely hurt us. It, I think it's helped a lot of kids who maybe strayed early on. You can get them deviated out of the system and get them the help they need. They don't recommit, reoffend. But there's some that are going to keep reoffending, and it makes it harder on us as law enforcement to really get some teeth in there. But we can, you know, actually put somebody. Well, we make charges. We don't put anybody in jail. That's somebody else's job to actually get them convicted and put them in jail. But that's what we're running up against the younger kids right now. Yeah, I've seen that for a while. I was just curious about that. Was, You're that correct. Trend varied any, but yeah. Um, the okay. So these other three are actually a kind of requests, and y'all can apply to whoever um, would cover. Um, we had a very tragic situation happen early in the year when the man with the murder suicide situation. Um, if we, we got that information, but I still think that if we knew what the numbers were at the FJC for last year, something close, something recent, if we could get that presented to this committee and, and out to the public too, that, that goes to show you we have, we, we did have that occur, but you would be, you know, you would appreciate how many lives were saved awesome. on that other end of that. Um, the other part is we have a new leadership in, the, in HP CAV. I think that would be great if he could come and talk with us and present to us. And, and once again, a, a big thank you to Jim Summit and all the years of service he provided for us in the city. Uh, I think that part would be great too. And the last piece is it's kind of a favor to a department um, that I did um, have a conversation with at another event. I said, I will bring it up. I will admit, admit I forgot. Um, weed and seed on Washington is having a similar issue that we used to have, or well, not to say used to, but had it over there um, near, um, <clears throat> kind of over in the Lexington area and the small businesses in that area with uh, certain people hanging around and, and maybe, uh, I don't know if it's aggressive panhandling in that sense. Uh, and then there's a, 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 a um, I guess a residence that, or a place, not a residence, but a, a business that has basically like a, live party all day long or something to that effect. I just told him, I, I, I didn't write down the right notes. I didn't bring it with me. Um, but I did say I would mention it and would ask, you know, that we take a look or have a conversation with the staff that, that works. No problem. I don't see an issue with any of those that you brought up. That'll pretty much go through us. I don't see another department handling those things. That's us. Okay. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. Just to say a big thank you to the work that you do. Um, I get phone calls of gunshots here or there. And a lot of times if I, I make the call or I ask a member of the police of that, they will tell me, oh, yeah, we looked at this and, and I don't get any return calls. That tells me that something's been done and it's much appreciated. I get a lot of thank yous from citizens. Good. That's good to know. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Uh, Councilman Johnson, I'll just say, considering that you all are Negative 41, I believe. Negative four. Negative four. Negative four. I wish it was 41. Man, I'd be no, dancing negative up here. Negative four. <laughs> negative four, but 41 officers down, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're minus 40 today. We hired a guy yesterday, so we're 40 now. But we're headed to negative 41. You know, we're headed Correct. Anywhere. So, but I thank you because, honestly, as, you, as, you, as those as you were, were talking, I was thinking about this, creating the single most livable safe. And that's what you guys are doing, and we, we seriously, we thank you. I do get comments as well um, in regards to, um, because I know a lot of that is going around where with police forces, um, the lack of officers or new officers. And, um, but I want to thank you personally um, on the job that our men and women are doing. So well, I appreciate that. But well, we do agree with you. That statement right there, the safe is our job. We just discussed that in our exec in our command staff meeting and it'll be discussed again next week that is our job we think it we make safe or a degree of safe you get more livable and you get more, probably more prosperous at the end of the day now we'll tell you are, are we as safe as i want us to be no i mean i'm greedy I, there, we're never going to be at the level that i want us to be and i can imagine working for me is very hard uh because we're always going to push. I'm going to push the envelope at all times. And ultimately, when I'm pushing, they're the ones that are end up doing the work. Uh, but that's what you get, a safer city. But I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Oh, just one more thing. Um, you speak of the 41 down. Don't forget to include any population growth we've had. 
and what those numbers like because that's something that on your per capita yes yeah just yep. make sure that you know we talk about that because the, the 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 number of people has gone up it has mm -hmm. but if you were to i don't know I'm, i guess the closest thing i'm trying to way i'm trying to describe it is if like if you compare box office from this like from this year yeah. of a movie to that year of a movie we understand what, yes yeah what the difference is what does play what it could be you know um so but yeah just include that if we, we will we'll do it a uh, couple quick things. First of all, uh, thank all of you, and I'm um, really glad to hear, and I've known it for a while, I, I appreciate your proactive stance. Uh, reaction is uh, usually not a good thing. So uh, I thank you for that. Uh, a couple more maybe specific. I think each of you have been, been at it a, a minute or two uh, in this game you referred to. From a social media standpoint and the way these youngsters, 17, 19, they all got cell phones. So is this just random pop-up stuff or is this game coordinated? Do they say we're meeting here and there? And if so, do you have the capability of using, I know you got the constitution to go by, but can you preempt some of this and have you been able to? Yes. Well, I don't think it's random to get that part out of the way. I think a lot of what you see out here is pre-coordinated. Social media does play a big role. Uh, the group that Jordan works with, our strategic intelligence unit, that's a large majority of their day is spent monitoring just social media outlets um, in many capacities. I won't give away all our tricks of the trade or anything like that. But we could cite many of cases where things have popped up and we said, this is getting ready to happen and we're able to intercept it and make some pretty key arrests uh, where we didn't have a We've already got crimes being committed, just not the most impactful ones yet. So, yes, we have taken advantage of that quite a bit, uh, but it's out there. I mean, we've noticed a lot of our criminals will tell you exactly what they're getting ready to do. There is not a lot of hiding out there right now. I don't know if that, I, can't, I can't answer why that is. It's become very brazen. Right. Uh, good. Uh, the other thing, I know that <clears throat> that is an issue. I mean, I'll just tell you, and, and that's our judicial and court system. And, <laughs> It got compounded with COVID uh, worse, um, but just out of curiosity of the, the ones you showed and the, uh, the, that were arrested and were waiting for trial, are they back out on the street? I don't think they're all still in, correct? Which is good. They're all still in. Good. For now. But I mean, they can, you know, they could post bond just like anybody else, I presume, at the end of the day. That could change tonight, tomorrow, but as of now, they are. Uh, but then again, we also see a dip in our numbers when people are, tend to be incarcerated. Right. I mean, he told you, 50% drop in Brentwood Crossing alone. And I don't think they're the only ones that are committing crimes over Brentwood Crossing. Because we laid a hotspot map over the city. I bet Brentwood would still light up. I bet when we get through a command staff net week, it's still number one uh, for where we want to put officers on the ground. Because we want, there's people living, there's good folks. We want to keep them safe. They deserve it. Thank you so much. You got it. Anything else? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you for coming. I mean, I, we're on our fourth year of this committee, you know, our first degree to chair it. I just was very clear I did not want to be an oversight committee. I have no business telling you how to do your jobs. Um, I just wanted to, I, I think it served its purpose well that our police department, uh, fire department, all of those of you got involved in public safety have an open forum to make sure council knows what's going on what you guys needs are so that we can make sure we support you but also i think as a benefit to us council members we're able to go back to our constituents who may have questions uh, and ask anything about public safety related matters so this is a really helpful committee i think for us mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people ask questions about high point and i'm like I, I feel very safe in my point, and it's because of the job you guys do. So we appreciate, appreciate that. all of y'all being here today, and for every time we ask you to come give us a report, and it's, it's usually good news. So I appreciate it. Good. I'll make sure I pass it along to our folks too. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. With that, I've got nothing more for this committee unless you want to ask us.